Okay, and just to start that, uh, so my name is Noah Lenstra, um, and I'm speaking to you from the campus of the University of North Carolina uh, in Greensboro. Uh, and this uh, is the fourth and final of four conversations uh, we're ho holding every Thursday during the month of April on cultivating the relationship-based uh, library. Um, and if you missed uh, any of our previous conversations, uh, they are now all available on YouTube. Um, and uh, my uh, graduate assistant, as well as public librarian uh, from Durham, North Carolina, Caroline Flory, will be putting the link uh, in the chat momentarily for you to access uh, past recordings. Um, and today, uh, we're really excited to uh, feature um, library workers from Texas, uh, Delaware, uh, and Virginia, um, talking about how uh, from very early on uh, in their career working in public libraries, uh, although in some cases having, having illustrious careers before um, coming to public libraries, um, how they were um, able to hit the ground running, immediately finding opportunities to work collaboratively with communities, um, uh, and we really want to consider how can we uh, all start where we are, um, and also how can we create pathways so that other other employees uh, in our libraries can also start where they are, um, uh, and and ultimately contribute to libraries and library systems where where everyone is empowered to kind of uh, form and leverage uh, relationships um, for the betterment of our libraries and for our communities. Um, uh, and, and just to jump right into this, um, uh, I want to just introduce uh, our panelists, um, and then we'll take it away. Um, so first we have uh, Celeste Blue, uh, who's the Assistant Manager uh, of Adult Services um, in the Programs, Partnerships, and Outreach Division of Harris County Public Library. Uh, she has worked in libraries since high school uh, and has worked at the Harris County Public Library since 2012, uh, shifting from branch level work to systems level work in 2021. Um, Celeste also serves on the Region 3 Advisory Board for the National Network of the Library of Medicine uh, and is an active member and leader in the Texas Library Association. Next, we have Kelly Sensor, who is the Programming and Community Engagement Coordinator for the Loudoun County Public Library in Northern Virginia. Uh, equal parts reader and nature explorer, Kelly regards libraries uh, as the great outdoors and the, and the great outdoors as treasured spaces to nurture one's sense of wonder. During her 20 years uh, at the National Wildlife Federation, prior to joining Loudoun County Library, um, uh, gardening for wildlife and the benefits of outdoor play were centerpieces of the content and programs uh, Kelly created. Passions for these subjects and community building now fuel her local efforts to connect people with nature. Uh, and finally, Stacy Lane uh, in Delaware comes from a retail management background um, and started in libraries a little over three years ago. She is now the Youth Services Librarian at the Laurel Public Library uh, in Laurel, Delaware. Uh, Stacy loves reading, collaging, and a good massage. Uh, who doesn't? Um, she can be found perusing thrift stores or yard sales in her spare time, uh, and she loves all things library and youth services. She resides in Delaware with her husband, their two children, two cats, and one dog, a full house. Um, so welcome, Celeste, uh, Kelly, uh, and Stacy. Um, and just to set the stage, uh, this conversation is going to have two parts. Uh, the first part will focus on on how um, our panelists got started working with with partners, um, uh, how they started where they they were, um, and the second part focuses on on how we can pay it forward, uh, helping others in our libraries um, uh, do this collaborative work where they are. Um, and before we jump in, uh, um, Caroline uh, is going to put another link in the chat uh, uh, to kind of enable another pathway for participation in today's conversation. We've also set up a couple of jam boards um, where you can uh, record uh, thoughts uh, and, and contribute to kind of a, a collaborative uh, document uh, from today's event. Um, and we'd love to know in our first jam board, um, uh, what are the the relationships or partnerships uh, that you would love to start uh, in your community based on where you are currently. So what are what are what are the things that you'd like to start where you are? Um, 
And with that, um, I'd like to kick off the conversation uh, with you, Celeste. Um, so hello, Celeste. Uh, first, uh, could you tell us, uh, and actually I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, so we can have a, a, a better conversation. Um, so Celeste, um, uh, could you tell us about how you got started building partnerships in Harris County relating to yoga, trauma, nutrition? Um, and how, how has your library administration created space uh, and support for you to build those relationships? Absolutely. So um, um, thank you all again for having me here today. Um, and it is an honor to speak with everybody. So as you may not know this, but Harris County is a really large county. It's one of the largest in the United States. We have 26 branches that we um, that we oversee at the administrative branch. Um, but before then, I was working in a library for quite a while. Um, I Again, as Noah said, I've only been in the administrative side for a couple of years, but I was at a branch library, a couple of branch libraries before then. As you know, in the Houston area, um, there's been a lot of since 2017 hurricane harvey hit um that was you know it's not a it's not a one day or a one week instance it's kind of something that that sets tremors within the community for years and years and years um as a library we were there on the front lines the day after the flooding ended i myself couldn't go into my home but i did go into work to be able to help people get online and um and have a safe place in the library um, the year after, I believe it was 2018, um, in our area, we had um, a horrific school incident in Santa Fe um, that affected a lot of our patronage as well. Um, so there's just a lot of things going on. Um, and as you know, in your communities, there have been horrific violence and um, and acts of nature that have gone on. So this isn't just our community, but it is something that truly affected us. Um, there were schools shut, schools shut down. There were um, homes that could never be returned to. This was really a really traumatic time for us. Um, at the time, I was a circulation supervisor. I didn't do programming or anything like that at the time of those incidents. But um, my organization switched my um, my job title, all of the circulation supervisors at that time into a more programming role. And that's what gave me the opportunity to think about what could my library actually, how could we actually make a difference in our community? What are the things that that are actually going to help our students, that are going to help the parents? Um, You've probably been to many conferences um, where they tell you, find your why, <laughs> you know, find your why, why are you doing what you're doing? And um, I did a lot of research at the time. I was trying to find where can I refer people? Where can I refer these families that come to me every day? Where can I refer these tired moms and these um, children that are just have no outlet, that have lost their schools, that have lost their homes? Um, quite literally um, many dozens and dozens and dozens of stories that I heard of people coming into our branch um, losing so much just in a couple of years and um, and so I did my research I said where can I refer these people to right and we're in reference we think like where can we take people yeah I mean there's services for food there's services for you know bills there's services for all of these things but there were no services for emotional support there were no services for stress relief there were no services especially not for children not within in Houston we're like a huge we're a huge city so you'd think if anybody had it it wouldn't be a rural town it'd be Houston um, but we didn't. We had absolutely nothing that was free for children to go to that would teach them um, mindfulness principles, that would teach them stress relief, that would help them with trauma. Um, if their parents didn't have insurance to take them to some a psychiatrist or counselor, then they were just dealing with it, and the parents too. So um, there were some charter schools that had programs, but this was not in public schools. Um, so I said, I did my research, I found, I, I try to find what we can do. And then I, I made a decision. I said, if, if it's not out there, it's something that I need to focus on. And it's something that I need to do. And that's where, you know, those partnerships kind of started building. Um, it, I looked for organizations that were already out there in the community. Um, one of my top organizations that I work with is um, 
a, a clinic here in Houston called lifestyledocs.com. They have a nonprofit called Peaceful Planet Foundation. They're led by two uh, medical doctors, Drs. Munish and Drs. Banda Nachawala. They were already doing work in the community. And I reached out to them first and foremost, because I knew they, again, they were already doing that work. I don't, I don't expect you to go to your doctor your local doctor and saying, hey, can you give a presentation at my library? Most likely they're not going to do it. So you really, the, my biggest advice is to look at festivals, to look at um, health fairs, to look at, you know, all of these, you know, community events that are already out there and see who is participating in them. The people that are participating in them are the ones that are going to be your allies, the ones that already want to be out there. Um, cold calls are difficult to make and sometimes they're resulting good results. And, um, but it's, it's not always a sure bet, right? So I, I did what I did. I, I, I researched, I found an organization first and foremost that, that could help me. And they had a, um, a curriculum that was in um, some private schools called the three M's, um, the five M's, excuse me, five M's of mindfulness, mindful breathing, mindful stillness, mindful eating, um, mindful movement, and mindful thinking, I believe. And so they were bringing this into schools already. And I thought, why can't they bring it into the library? So the first thing I did was I created this workshop where we did a two day workshop and brought in children and their parents to learn some of these basic concepts, just simple things they could do at home. Um, from there, I, 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 I learned very early on that this was going to be my core mission. This is what, this was going to be what I was going to do in the library. It wasn't I mean, I have book club, I have all of these other things that are also really important, but this was going to be um, the thing that, that I worked towards, the thing that woke me up every day. So I went and got training. Um, there is another organization here in Houston. I was reaching out. They were mostly um, teaching school teachers. Um, it's called, um, the curriculum is called Most Mindful and Amazing Strategies for Students and Teachers. And it's just different strategies to use to cope with stress, different strategies to use to, to just incorporate daily things in your life. So I started doing some of her training. This was um, an organization led by a woman. Her name is Dr. Beth Reese. I reached out to her and the training was expensive. It was not something that my, my library was able to pay for. I was able to get some funding later from NNLM, um, but it was a choice that I made for myself to keep myself informed and to keep my community informed. And that's kind of where it all started. Um, after that, I got a grant from the National Network of Libraries of Medicine to be able to build a mindfulness program for children. Um, this was in 2019 that I applied for it, and I got it early 2020, actually, which was <laughs> incidental a little bit, but the program was able to continue virtually. I had um, a wonderful amount of students every week. Um, there was one little boy, a five-year-old from Portland that would come every week and learn mindfulness-based strategies. So um, not only that, I was able to expand it um, to, um, to adults as well. Um, I got, had Drs. Munish and Drs. Bonzana, who helped me in the very beginning, come back in and speak to the adults. Um, and um, I had a really great turnout, 25 to 30 people each session. And um, from, from the things that were spoken about in that first session about um, through Doc, the doctors Munish and doctors Bandana, I kind of spread out through there. They talked a lot about gut health and how that helps your mind and your emotions. So we had a gut health specialist come back in. We learned how to make um, fermented foods. You know, we had um, from there, we talked a lot about spices and herbs, simple things that you can incorporate into your life. So I had an Ayurvedic specialist come in and talk about all of the different herbs that you can incorporate. Um, I think we had a kombucha workshop. We had um, we had a lot of fun and it was just really starting. It, it, it kind of just stemmed from each conversation and each and each um, each presentation that was given that I had the idea of, OK, let's expand on this topic. People are already interested in this. I know people are coming um, and reaching out to people that are already out there. Another one of my partners was the Herb Society of America. They did a lot of programming here in the Houston area. And um, they had a lot of sessions that they had already done before in the past. And I just asked them to repeat 
one of the sessions they had already created. It wasn't something brand new I was asking them to do. Most of these people, these were all things they're already doing in their communities and they're more likely to bring it to you and to, um, and to be open and available to your library system. Another thing that I did, which was like a top thing of mine was that everybody I met, and I think I told Noah this, everybody I met and I looked at throughout, you know, my, my interactions just in my personal life, I met it with the lens of like, how could this person help my library? Could this person come in and bring something to my library? Anybody I met really, <laughs> because it, most likely if they're out there and, you know, they have business cards and everything, they're going to kind of charge a lot of money for to come in. So this was just people that I was talking to. There's um, one person I met at a potluck and she is a um, feng shui specialist and an aromatherapy specialist. And um, I had her come in, <laughs> you know, I just, I just, it was just someone I met at a potluck and, um, so don't be afraid to, to ask your friends or your new friends for help um, to come in um, and build these connections. These are connections that people in my community wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, they would never have gone to an Ayurvedic specialist and learn about herbs. They would have never, they didn't, most people weren't even familiar with fermented foods when we did that fermented foods workshop. Um, this is just not the area that would have ever paid for a class or paid for extra learning. And it was really, it was really satisfying to bring those connections to my community, things that otherwise they would have never seen or they would have never heard of. And um, I think when you bring those types of valuable things to your organization, to your community, I think it, it people, people listen and people follow and people can see that there's worth in it. Um, I was very fortunate to be a part of an organization that supported me um, because of the work that I had done before. I know, unfortunately, that's not the case everywhere. But what I would say to that is to do your research, um, do your research, write down facts, find the other programs that are comparable in your organization, in your, in your um, communities. And there's a lack there. Um, I think it's very, very likely that your organization will support you that they will have your back, that they will give you the tools that you need to be able to succeed in whatever endeavors you're looking for. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Celeste. Uh, that was uh, amazing and inspiring uh, and just uh, really, really great advice. Um, and I just wanted to quickly follow up. Uh, Celeste um, actually directed me to Dr. Muniz, so I was able to speak with him. Um, and I just wanted to add uh, Dr. Muniz, uh, lifelong library lover, um, uh, takes his family there, goes. Um, but he had never thought, uh, oh, I have this curriculum. Why, why don't I use why don't I share it through the library? It had never occurred to Dr. Muniz and most likely would never have occurred to Dr. Muniz um, were it not for Celeste reaching out. Um, but it's it's really uh, an amazing example of the power of just reaching out to people who may not have thought of libraries as kind of vehicles for, for lifelong learning uh, and programming. And sometimes that's that's literally all that it takes is just making that connection to, to kind of close the gap. Um, so thank you so much, Celeste. Um, I'd now like to shift from uh, one of the largest counties in America uh, to a small town uh, in southwest Delaware. Um, and so, Stacy, um, uh, when when you joined uh, the Laurel Public Library a few years ago, uh, you you hit the ground running. Um, could you tell us about how you uh, got connected with uh, your local Boys and Girls Club, um, as well as other organizations, as well as about how your predecessor, Abby, um, prepared you to immediately uh, jump into community partnership work? Sure. So um, I'm kind of a different case because I was working with Abby when she was going on maternity leave, and I was supposed to be the, you know, basically just her uh, her position for the summer while she was taking care of her child. Well, she ended up moving and um, moving back to her hometown with her husband. And then the position became open and Abby was like, you should totally do this because you can. You'd be great at it. And I was just like, I don't know. Because up to that point, I'd been a stay-at-home mom for a very long time. I think it was like 10 years. And um, I hadn't worked full-time for a long time. I mean, I'd worked like three part-time jobs, but not one continuously. So um, I did, I applied for it. 
I got the job. And then the entire country shut down for COVID. Yay. So everything that Abby and I had planned didn't go through. And <laughs> so what I ended up doing was much like everybody else, we didn't know what to do. We kind of focused more on social media, which if you're in a rural town in Delaware, a lot of people don't have access to on the internet. So that was basically not as fruitful as, as it could be for other libraries. So um, I did continue working on the social media aspect of it just in little bits and pieces, but not necessarily virtual programming. But um, we did a lot of take and makes. We tried to stay up to date with the community as much as we could, just kind of check in with people that we knew from the library. Um, we did curbside, just much like everybody else. And um, then uh, basically, we were one of the first libraries to open after COVID uh, in our area. So we were open a lot longer than some of the other libraries in and around us, in Delaware and around us. So um, we, followed all the protocols, everything like that, but I had never worked in libraries before. So while the kids were off of school, you know, you think, okay, well, school will be a great place to get started as a librarian because that's where the kids are. Well, when they're learning virtually, you don't have that option. So I was like, well, where are the kids going to be? So the Boys and Girls Club still had kids in their club. And I called them up and we worked with them on a grant that they had recently gotten and um, formed a great partnership with them. Like we would go in, I would do crafts with them. Um, I've taught them. We did a, lit a family literacy program recently um, that involved the parents and the families after school. Um, or, and after uh, pickup, they came for dinner and we read stories together. We've done a lot of different things. We provide hygiene bags to the teens that go in the after schools. Like um, the way the Boys and Girls Club works is that they have kids in their club up to the age of 12 and then at the end of the day when after all the kids are picked up um the teens come in so we have um we worked with with all of the coordinators in the boys and girls club so that we were kind of helping each kid at each stage of their life so that really helped me form a relationship with not only the club but the kids that went there too and then they would tell their parents oh let's go to the library or i know her if they saw me in public or at another event much like celeste said you always want to just get your name out there. You just want to, you know, talk to the people that are around you, like whether it be a, a potluck, an event, um, you always kind of want to have that accountability. Um, my husband always laughs at me because he's like, we can't ever go anywhere without you starting a conversation for about an hour and making a new friend. But honestly, it's helped me so much because where I didn't have that library background, um, it helped create partnerships and just, you know, just friends, honestly. Um, that were willing to help me out in the library when I needed it. And since the library is turning more into a community hub than just a book repository, um, since I didn't have that background and I wasn't used to the library being limited like that, I was able to, as my boss says, say, well, why can't libraries do that instead of why, you know, why would libraries do that? So um, we've, we've luckily, just like Celeste as well, we were able to have a great um, leadership team that is really open to pretty much anything we want to try within reason. And, you know, um, she's very open. She's very helpful. And she's a great mentor of mine, my director, Gail Bruce. And um, I think that really helps is when we're all on the same page, library joke, haha. And, <laughs> and then we'd all just work together to help each other out. And if it's a failure, it's not necessarily a failure. It's just a learning experience. And we learn how we could possibly do it better the next time. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stacey. And, and I love that idea that uh, you can't go anywhere without uh, starting a, a conversation with someone, um, uh, probably mixing personal and professional together. And, and that's, I, I think that's true of most, most small towns. Uh, so I think that's, yeah. But uh, thank you so much, uh, Stacey. Very inspiring. Um, and, and now I'd like to, like to just shift a, a little bit uh, to uh, Northern Virginia um, and, and Kelly uh, Fencer, um, who, as we mentioned at the top of the conversation, had uh, an illustrious career before uh, joining the library, working for the National Wildlife Federation for 20 years. Um, and so uh, I'd love to ask you, Kelly, um, how you were able to leverage those connections and background um, into your library work, um, and also how your employer, the Loudoun County Public Library, supported you um, in making those connections and relationships. 
Yes, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, while I was at this national nonprofit uh, for two decades, it was also headquartered locally. So throughout my tenure, I was building relationships with local conservation education groups uh, that were like-minded doing similar work, um, whether it's engaging in outdoor play or gardening and those sorts of things. Um, and even uh, when I decided to leave that big group and focus my efforts locally, I feel like those relationships actually uh, guided me on my path to the library because the very first opportunities I had uh, both as an instructor in Parks and Rec and then um, as a volunteer and outreach coordinator for a local uh, wildlife conservancy, uh, those opportunities I feel came to me because the folks who offered them uh, knew me, right? Because we were all part of the same community. And indeed, even when I joined the library system, Loudoun County Public Library, um, the children's services team at Sterling Library, uh, we were co-located in the community center where I worked. So I was already uh, working with the library on certain projects. So I feel like relationships, like you said, uh, whether it's friendships or professional um, associations, I mean, they do uh, kind of guide you as you go. Um, and I feel as far as like leveraging those connections, when I first got to the library, obviously, so much was new um, and my duties were varied, um, but uh, the programming aspect of it um, included, uh, uh, you know, story times and other such, but I was encouraged by my system to do nature-based programming. Certainly there were other branches that did it, um, but there wasn't a lot going on in my particular branch. And um, as you all know, we all have our, our passions and, and subject matter knowledge and that sort of thing. So I was encouraged to share that. Um, and I think that passion comes through um, when you do. Um, but beyond just the programming, uh, there's two other things that I, I'm very, uh, feel so good about that in my very early library career, my system encouraged me. Um, I was part of a Loudoun Environmental Education Alliance, which is this coalition of schools and groups and um, agencies and that sort of thing before I came to the library when I was working for the uh, local wildlife conservancy. But I had noticed at one of the meetings, there was a library staff member there, but not regularly. Um, so I asked the director, is this a space we want to be in? Um, because if we do, I'd love to be that representative if you're looking for someone to be there regularly. And they said, absolutely, that would be great. Um, so I continued that work, you know, just switching hats, um, putting on my library hat and thinking about it in a different way. Um, and again, there's so many folks at the table, um, folks uh, that could come in and do uh, the children's focused uh, programming uh, that I was doing at the time, um, but also partners that we could do things with out in the community. We created a student environmental action showcase, which brought all parties and many generations together to talk about stewardship and, and, and making the world a better place. And we did loud nature days and certainly the library had programs related to that, but so did the whole community. So that was just very exciting. Um, and another thing that the library system afforded me, uh, I saw a grant opportunity um, offered by the Division of Wildlife uh, Resources in our state. Um, it was based on like nature or wildlife watching, that sort of thing, which was certainly in my wheelhouse. Um, and I said, hey, I'm looking through this uh, grant opportunity. I've never seen the library apply. And I think we're a great space space um, for this type of work. Um, so I developed uh, a pitch, um, a wild about nature programming series that would go throughout the year and we utilize like binoculars and other things that this grant, um, if we got, would uh, allow us to purchase. Um, and my system was very supportive. I worked with the community and um, and programming team that I'm a part of now. Um, we submitted it and on the eve of my first anniversary, we were awarded the grant. So I feel like very early on in my career at the library, um, I just was encouraged, right? Like my system said, oh, we see you have this passion. Um, it can help our system um, go for it. Um, so I would say, as others have, you know, have conversations, build those relationships um, with partners and others because they've certainly um, in, enriched what we're able to offer. But I feel very strongly, as I'm sure you all do, that like the library is like a, 
is a network reaver. Like they connect folks. And, um, you know, I have a someone come in from the Loudoun Soil and Water Conservation District and talk about uh, worms and composting and that sort of thing. But I found in doing this children's programming that parents were learning as much as their kids. So, you know, they're wanting to bring these opportunities to their schools. And I feel like, okay, the library made that introduction and, you know, and that relationship, their relationship continues on, you know, even beyond us. So um, I just feel like it's a really great thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that my uh, library system supports that. Yeah, thank you so much, Kelly, and that's great. And and how amazing that you you were able to get that grant, uh, even even your first year at the library, and also represent the library on that environmental uh, coalition or, or group that you mentioned. Um, and and we now like to transition uh, to kind of how do we how do we create systems um, and and broader broader changes uh, within the library profession so that everyone can start where they are. So what 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 can we do locally, regionally, nationally to to enable everyone who works in libraries to start where they are, kind of in in ways that you have. Um, and, uh, and Caroline is going to put a link uh, into our second jam board. And I just took a look and thanks to those of you. Um, I see a few people shared some thoughts in the jam board already. Um, but we're going to be putting another jam board to get your thoughts uh, completely anonymous um, about kind of what works well in terms of enabling you and your staff to start where they are and, and what, what really hinders or blocks um, uh, you from or your colleagues from doing the work of uh, the Celeste and, and Kelly um, and Stacy. Um, and I'd, I'd love to kind of uh, turn things back to Celeste. Um, and Celeste, now that you um, uh, have uh, work at, within your library's um, programs, partnerships, and outreach division at the system level, um, could you tell us a little bit about how you've, uh, you've been able uh, to support library staff um, so that they too can build uh, impactful partnerships and relationships um, um, yeah, t tell us about that work that you're doing now and, and how you kind of pay it forward. Yeah, definitely. So I've worked, um, I've only worked at this higher system level, as I, as I said, for two years, um, but I was at a branch for several years before then. Um, I've been in libraries now professionally 15 years. And um, so I've been on the front lines for a long, long, long time. I've been on the front lines and lower level library work for a long time. Um, so I can really see, you know, being at the administrative level, you do get a lot of, um, there are a lot of, um, you can kind of feel, what am I trying to say? <laughs> you can kind of feel the frustrations of staff, you know, a lot of what we get here at the administrative offices is just frustrations, you know, like, you know, they see the red tape, but they don't see, you know, all of the efforts sometimes that we're trying to bring in. So I try to be as open. Um, there's a lot of staff that have great ideas, you know, they have really, really great ideas. And I, what I like to do first and foremost is anytime I see a great idea or I see someone doing something good work, um, I like to acknowledge it because that, that wasn't always done whenever I was, you know, whenever I was there for whatever reason, you know, it's, um, we're such a large system. We have um, four to 500 um, employees. It's really hard to be able to see each and every one, you know, so I didn't, I didn't feel, you know, when I was at the branches, a lot of times people felt like, oh, our, you know, people don't even see what we do. So I think I like to bring it from that perspective of really seeing people and really seeing what they're doing. I like to go out, um, just recently, I, I, I finished, I just finished a project where it's finishing. It's a large grant. It's actually the largest grant in United States history. And I was put as the lead of it. And um, instead of just, you know, I, I created this, you know, 18, 20 page document of how to do this program. And I released it and I gave trainings. And instead of just doing that, leaving it like that, what I did was I went out and I went to all of the branches. I was in constant communication with all of the leaders and the libraries that were facilitating this program. And I mean, it takes work. I mean, especially with 26 branches, one, one branch could be two hours away from the other one. And I was driving to all of these locations, but it's really important to be 
on the ground and to be working in and seeing what people are doing really really truly seeing not just an email hey i hope your your branch is doing okay you know um cultivating those relationships within your community within your library community is is what's really going to bring them on board whenever you have a large initiative as well, whenever you have something going on as well, if you if you are um, also supporting them and what they need um, at the times when, when they're doing great work. Um, just So just seeing that work, acknowledging the work, um, congratulating the work um, and building on it. If, you, if I have the means and the, the facilities to do so, I try to, I try to my very best to support them. You know, there is this one, um, there's this one program that we're doing. Actually, Noah um, um, brought me together with uh, uh, Old Ways organization. They have a a, a culture, excuse me, a culture based food program. Um, and um, some of the branches didn't have money to even just buy the food. Unfortunately, with our budget at the administrative offices, we can't purchase food. But I said, hey, you know, it's not that much money. It's $20 probably for one recipe, even less, maybe $10. I would love to sponsor any library that doesn't have the means to buy this food to create this program. So doing those things, um, it doesn't cost a lot. You know, it doesn't cost a lot to reach out to people. You know, we're all tired. We're all, you know, we've all been through it, but the only way we're going to really, really get through it is together. So I like to remember that. Yeah, thank you, Celeste. Uh, so, so inspiring. And I love this idea that um, it starts with kind of visibility and, and really seeing people um, and seeing kind of uh, what they're doing and celebrating what they're what they're what they're accomplishing, but also seeing people um, if they if they happen to be suffering uh, and need support. Um, so, so very inspiring. Um, uh, and Kelly, um, I wanted to turn things to you because you've had a similar trajectory in your your career, um, uh, moving from the Sterling branch um, uh, into now the role of programming and community uh, engagement coordinator for the Loudoun County Library. Um, and so, I'd love to hear as you as you've moved into that system level, um, uh, how does the relationship work differ, and how have you supported uh, staff uh, in your system in being that kind of community partner? Um, and the ways that that you you are and were okay yes thank you very much um yes i love that i came up through the branches um because that gives me an understanding of what happens there and uh the communication needs and uh support needs and so i echo what celeste said about you know expressing appreciation and and being engaged uh with the branch staff because that's how we all help one another, regardless of what level we're in, is understanding, even if it's at a basic level, what's happening and how it all uh, is connected um, and how we uh, can be successful. Um, I think some of the partnership work I do is, is similar, right? I may be planning a, a specific program myself and I reach out uh, to those partners in the community. Um, uh, but I, I feel very much too, like in addition to that environmental coalition I was part of, I'm now part of the Loudoun Pediatric Obesity Coalition, which much like Let's Move in Libraries is focused on healthy eating and active living. Um, you know, we've got food pantries and, and schools and all manner of folks. And um, I just really, uh, I, I feel like sometimes that's what's a little different. I mean, the coalition work is the same, but um, what's happening in those uh, groups, you know, we're, um, we're sharing, we're listening to one another, we are learning, um, we collectively seek out training opportunities, you know, we are working together to figure out where our unserved yeah, needs are in our community and how can we collaborate, um, you know, to, to address that need and support and reach those underserved communities. So I feel like that's one way. Um, I feel like it's a little deeper level. Um, and sometimes too, you know, it's just, um, you know, we've got a food drive going this week, which ties in um, to, to meeting um, needs in our community, but, it, but it's bigger than that too. And, um, and like I said, in ways big and small, um, I don't know, we all have different resources, um, like, for instance, Parks and Rec, they have these, what they call unmanned uh, parks, right? They're 
parks are maintained by the system, but they don't have staff dedicated, so they don't have programming. So, you know, trying new things. We started, you know, come for a story and stay to play because, you know, the library system and others have a collection of story walks. The local wildlife conservancy encourages outdoor play and, and the benefits of that, the health benefits of that. So you follow the story walk and then you come to this cool nature play spot that might be in the middle of a lawn and, you know, you uh, have a new opportunity and, and sometimes those things are successful and sometimes they're not. But like what, what's great about the partnerships too is you're, you're learning together, you're growing together. Um, and I just feel like there's a real benefit in that, just the active participation, whatever it is, even if it's like a casual conversation, you know, you're in it and you're learning. And, um, you know, I feel like there's so much opportunity. And um, yeah, I guess that to me, that's what, what, what's a little different, but it's just connecting uh, staff throughout the system that I still work with, you know, with great resources. Oh, you want to do a program about that? You know, there's a master gardener that can do it or a master naturalist or someone else in the community um, that's passionate about what they do. And we want to bring that passion to the library because then that extends again back out into the community and it connects them to uh, new experiences, which is lovely. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Kelly. And I, I love this idea that in your role, uh, you're able to use uh, the your, your network, uh, your ever expanding network, I should say, to connect uh, staff uh, to resources. So if someone says, I'd like to do something on X, uh, you can say, uh, do you know why? Uh, and if not, let me connect you. Um, and so I love that. Um, uh, I, and and so um, uh, I'd love now to to turn things to Stacy. And of course, uh, in in a small town library um, like Laurel Public Library, there is no kind of uh, system level administration. Of course, you have a dep a director and assistant director, but there's no kind of system wide staff like uh, like uh, Celeste um, and Kelly. Um, and so, but nonetheless, uh, I've been really impressed at how you've been able to uh, pay it forward, as it were, by getting involved um, in organizations like the Rural Library Network, uh, Delaware Division of Libraries, um, to really think about how how uh, you can get involved uh, both in your state and in the country. Um, and so I'd love to hear from your perspective and, and kind of small town context, um, how and why you see these peer-to-peer -peer library networks um, as important, not not only for building your own capacity, but also for um, building the capacity of others in the profession to kind of start where they are? Sure. Um, one of the things that I just think that those types of organizations really drive home is that you're not alone. I mean, we all know that all libraries are different. You know what I mean? That's what basically is so special and awesome about libraries. We're all different. So we're all, you know, governed differently. We're all, you know, um, have different ways that we do things, how, pe which people take care of what. And I think that why the most important thing I learned from um, working with a rural library network is I, and the fellowship that I was involved in with them, because that's how it all started, was that there was a group of women that were other librarians in other states. We were all different, yet we were all the same. And we all were having different challenges or, you know, different challenges, but could also be somewhat similar. So it really helped by them just being honest and being like, okay, yeah, you know what? I don't have the best school partnership with my library. So how would I go about doing that? And, you know, we would all like throw out ideas for each other. We would help each other. If somebody had a good partnership with their schools, they would like reach out and help you with that. Um, and I think that's the, the greatest benefit to those types of organizations because not to discount ALA, because I mean, they are great too, but you know, ARSL, the Association for Small Rural Libraries, I have more of a connection to a lot of the members that way. Same thing with the Rural Library Network. What we're trying to do with that is that we're trying to show you that, um, you know, we're all in the same boat. This is how we can all work together in a rural context and get things done our way and or we're, the, how we're able to get things done. So, um, Honestly, that was the best thing that I learned from the Rural Library Fellowship that I was in is to create a network of librarians in a similar situation as you and, you know, just be able to commiserate with them, be able to celebrate your victories, um, just bounce ideas off of anything the case may be, uh, just the importance of networking, honestly. And just like Kelly said, um, 
being able to have those people that you're like, oh, you're doing this program. Well, this guy can do this virtually. And even though you're in North Carolina, he can do a virtual painting program with your, with your patrons that way. I mean, that's the beauty of being post COVID too, is that everybody knows how to use, utilize those resources. So um, yeah, I think that that's why everybody should think about being involved in organizations like that. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Stacey. Um, and, and, uh, and just, uh, I wanted to just pause, uh, just here for one second and make a, a quick kind of time keep timekeeping segue. Uh, so just, uh, for the flow of this afternoon, um, we have about uh, 15 minutes uh, more in our quote unquote official conversation. Um, and then uh, for folks uh, interested in, in staying on, uh, we'll have uh, 30 minutes for unconference. Uh, we'll go to the jam boards at the, their point and pull up um, your struggles and successes and where you want to build relationships. Um, uh, but I also just uh, want to follow up on Stacy's point uh, by encouraging those who are able to um, to, to join us um, uh, at 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, 2 p.m. Central, uh, noon Pacific. Uh, we're gonna have um, our concluding conversation on where do we grow from here um, in terms of um, leveraging uh, the network uh, that has come together around this event uh, to continue to cultivate pathways uh, for, for people to share um, and grow together. Um, but I, I'd love to just uh, pull things back to our, our conversation right now. So, uh, and first, uh, Kelly, uh, Celeste, uh, Stacy, I'd love to ask you, um, as you uh, heard your colleagues talking, um, did you all have uh, questions for one another, thoughts you'd like to share? Um, first, I'd love to, love to kind of just open the floor to the three of you, and then I'll open it to our, our wider audience. I, I just appreciate the similarities. I mean, uh, like you said, similar in the way that we're all different. I mean, even with we have 10 branches in our system and each of the branches is very different and how they operate because the community they serve is slightly different. And, um, you know, so I, I always just appreciate uh, hearing from other um, library peers. I mean, this is relationship building too. This is what we're talking about, you know, like that shared experience and, and the shared problem solving. I mean, it, it's so great. You know, it's hard to operate in a silo. You know, um, sometimes we're all asked to do it, but it, it's so much richer and we get to um, progress, I think, more quickly. We grow more quickly when we're, we're in it together. So I think that's important. Yeah, definitely. Just like Kelly said, we do grow more quickly when we get to it together. That's why these opportunities are so important. I think a lot of times maybe we might see something come through or an opportunity through one of our organizations and we're like, oh, you know, is that really going to, am I really going to get the brightest, newest idea there? You might not. But what you are going to get is you're going to get um, sympathy from other librarians. You're going to get that camaraderie. You're going to get that sense that, hey, I am where I need to be right now. And I think a lot of times that's a little more valuable than having a great brand new program idea. You know, having, you know, your peers being able to to not just not just share where they are, they are, but you sharing with them where you are. And um, I think that's really, there's a lot of value in that. So continuing to, to take part in these, in these conversations and listening to them um, is really important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, even if it's just to, you know, like how we're all similar yet different, you know, you hear somebody talk about or complain about something in their branch, you're like, wow, we're really lucky. We don't have to deal with that. Or be <laughs> like, we're really unlucky because we have, you know, this such and such in place. So it's just, it's just cool because um, I know that like, just for instance, for example, we do hygiene stations on the back of our doors in the bathrooms. And when I brought that up at the Royal Fellowship to the fellows, they were just like, what? And I know a lot of them had incorporated that. So um, yeah, I just, I, and to Celeste's point, I love how you were, you so, you're so big on visibility and transparency, because I think that is a big plus in the library world when you are willing to share with others and then celebrate their victories as well. They're more likely to work with you when you need something and not necessarily you're doing it just because of that, but also, you know, just to work together with your peers. Oh, what does a hygiene station have in it? Oh, okay. Good question. 
So um, our hygiene station was, it's basically just one of the shoe trees that goes on the back of the door that you buy from the Dollar Tree. And it has things on the back that um, we noticed that teens and people of low income, which we are the poorest town in Delaware, um, don't have access to. Because if you're going to take your last $5, are you going to buy food or are you going to buy deodorant? So um, we took that question and we turned it into that shoe organizer and we put things like toothpaste, toothbrushes, uh, we put tissues, deodorant, chapstick, things like that. Things that, um, oh, thank you, Noah. Thank you for that. Yeah, we have pictures of our hygiene stations too, but that has been one of the most beneficial things in our library, honestly, because we offer uh, sanitary products to women um, because, you know, Again, there was that shortage for a while, but also because, again, if you don't have money for certain things, that's going to be on the back burner and you're going to create more problems for those kids in school if they don't have access to things like that. So um, it really did fill a need in our community. We're um, working on different things, too, on how we can uh, improve on those, too, and offer more things. We just uh, we just um, created a food pantry for our patrons, we used to have food carts outside and now we were able to expand it to a full pantry. So we're lucky. We have a lot of great partnerships with people that um, we are able to utilize for things like that. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Stacy and Celeste and Kelly. And, and yeah, I think that's that's amazing. Um, and yeah, we, we have uh, some time. Uh, if anyone uh, has questions, uh, we actually have the room set up so that you can uh, actually go ahead and unmute. So we have it set up so that everyone can turn on their microphones. Um, so if anyone has a, a question or thought they'd like to share, um, would encourage you to, to turn on your mic and, and share away. You can also use the chat, but um, wanted to give you all some time for, for any questions or thoughts uh, that you may be sitting with at the moment. Come on, ask us anything. <laughs> <laughs> I know someone asked in the chat about old ways. Um, it's it's a feat to get it <laughs> to get this to a lot of libraries, but for a single library, I think it's it's an amazing amazing resource or multiple libraries. But I put that link there in the chat, and um, Noah had another link there as well um, from their webinar last May. So check that out. It's a wonderful resource. Um, it's a program in a box. Very easy. All you have to do is follow the slideshow. Um, it gives you all the resources, all the books and everything you're going to need. You do need to purchase some food. Um, it's about $10 each recipe, if that much. Um, but it's a really, really great program. So I do highly recommend it. If I was at a branch, I would be all over this. <laughs> but we are releasing it to several of our branches um, um, and our librarians will be teaching it. There's another program called Common Threads that has a similar uh, a similar curriculum to it. Uh, and the nice thing with Common Threads is in certain states, the food is actually paid for through a gift card. Um, so if you are one of the eligible states, you can even get the food paid for as well. But Common Threads is a free one as well. And you would just basically uh, do a train the trainer session and then have, um, you would be able to facilitate the classes yourselves and the recipes are easy and healthy. And I know some communities that we have um, in ours, like master food volunteers, similar to the way the, the master gardeners operate, where they come out and provide instruction and healthy meal preps and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of different resources. I know even our local uh, like hospital system does um, that kind of education. You know, some of theirs is very much focused on kids, healthy plate club, but um, you know, there's a lot out there and um, yeah, keep your eyes open, ears too. Um, I'm also linking in here um, the curriculum that I mentioned when I spoke uh, mindful and amazing strategies for students and teachers it is it does cost money but they do a lot of training sessions for organizations and they can come in virtually and teach your staff how to use um, the curriculum or we can just purchase the curriculum and use it as is it's very um, user-friendly 
but I actually did a lot of training sessions with Dr. Beth, Beth Reese on um, um, stress and trauma strategies for children. And, um, and she's a wonderful instructor and she has a wonderful organization, but it's there in the, in the chat if you need. And of course, if you need funding, please look to um, National Network of Libraries of Medicine. There's lots and lots and lots of grants available. It just, it does take some time. It does, you, you will need to do your research. Well, you will need to do your writing, but if you have your why set in place, um, if you have a need in your community, it's, it's definitely worth it. Um, I can link in here and, and every region has different opportunities. So that's the thing. I can't really link in here all the opportunities, um, but, but look into it. If you need, they also have funding for, um, for professional development as well. So if you're interested in, in learning something um, that your community needs, I was able to get some funding for professional development at one point. Um, so look into that. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing with grant writing, because I'm not a professional grant writer, I didn't have any former experience with that, is just to tell your story to the grantees. And, you know, that's the best way that Laurel has been able to get grants is because, you know, we tell the story of our town and of our library and how we're the lifeline of the town sometimes. Mm -hmm. So um, that's your best bet. Yeah. NNLM has lots of different opportunities as well to teach you how to grant write. Um, of course, I, I mean, I didn't go to school for grant writing either, and I've had several successful that I've been the lead of now, and, um, but they have lots of different sessions as well to help you. Um, I just came back from um, Texas Library Association Conference, as you know, many of your um, state-run librarian organizations will also have opportunities like that. I think there were several last week at that conference, so look out and get on the listservs, and it's worth it. I mean, you know, an hour of your day is worth it just to learn a little bit more and get your community closer to the resources it needs. Yep, I think that's so true. It just, um, you know, because we are subject matter experts, you know, in our communities, right? So we can speak to that. We can talk about um, the customers we serve and all that. And that's like the foundation of that grant writing, that storytelling, right? It comes through and it's, it's so valuable. And I appreciate Celeste too, talking about professional development. I mean, you know, there's relationship building that happens there. Like I know our um, county, you know, several of us have gone through mental health first aid training and other versions of that, but it, it's so valuable, like, because, you know, sometimes in library systems, you know, you're asked to know a lot of things or asked about a lot of things. You may not know them all. You just got to point people, um, but it can, you know, be overwhelming. Um, but, you know, seeking out those opportunities puts you on, you know, firmer footing and allows you to, you um, you know, be helpful and responsive in, in, in critical situations, so. Yeah, this is great. And, and I love this, uh, this focus on storytelling um, and also uh, knowing your why uh, and having kind of the relationships uh, and the request for funding kind of flowing from, from the, the why, the thing that, that motivates you. Um, and just want to pull things back full circle to where we began today with uh, Celeste uh, talking about uh, some of the things that she saw in her community in Houston um, uh, after hurricanes um, and some uh, violent incidences creating uh, both physical, um, spiritual, and mental trauma, and having that being a, a motivating factor to going out uh, to forming new relationships um, uh, that benefited her library, benefited her community, um, and, and ultimately led to new opportunities, not only locally, but, uh, but statewide and even nationally. Um, uh, so, um, and I think we heard similar similar stories from Stacy and Kelly. So, I wanna I wanna thank the three of you. Um, for, for kind of participating today. Um, we're not gonna give you the oh heave ho. Uh, we'd love to have you kind of continue um, on for uh, the second part of our, our conversation, but um, if you all need to go, um, that's fine as well. Um, but I wanna just uh, segue directly into our, our Jamboard. Um, and so I'll put a link here um, into the chat um, uh, if you want to participate. Um, but uh, some people have already started uh, to uh, share here. Um, 
And so uh, we, we asked, uh, how does your library create pathways for staff uh, at all levels uh, and what obstacles exist? So I'm reading things like uh, libraries where uh, staff take turns uh, attending various events. So it's not just one person always doing the outreach. Uh, you kind of share, share the load um, to enable everyone to form new contacts. Um, uh, and, and one of the obstacles are that sometimes uh, partners um, just want uh, to make sales, so they're not really interested in kind of, yeah, if, if it's a for-profit, um, another person writes uh, that an obstacle is that librarians are liaisons and we don't have enough librarians to maintain all the relationships. So it's how do you maintain the relationships, especially when you're in a, a short-staffed environment? Um, uh, um, it, uh, these relationships can help the library meet leaders uh, and obstacles uh, include communication and funding, um, uh, staff staff desk time, I just see come in, especially in a smaller library, but, but really all libraries, um, uh, I like this tiered approach. Um, uh, and so, yeah, uh, just uh, uh, I'd love to just open things up. Uh, everyone can add to this Padlet, um, but um, uh, if if you, uh, Kelly um, or uh, Celeste uh, or Stacy, if if you're still here with us, um, uh, do you have any any reactions to kind of what you're you're seeing on the screen now? Um, uh, ways that you or your libraries uh, have perhaps uh, faced similar challenges, and and any any kind of reaction this time. Um, yeah, what what may be possible solutions to some of these issues? I think I heard you say I don't I don't see it about the partners just wanting to make a sale. Is oh that, yeah, is that what? Yeah, you, yeah. Somebody wrote yeah, that. Yeah, um, that that happens. <laughs> um, that happens. That's why. Um, that's one one of my. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned go for people that are already in the community doing stuff. If you most likely if someone's giving you their business card um, at an or at an event, most likely they are wanting to make a sell, unfortunately. Um, and, and maybe it's a price your library can pay. Maybe it's not. So um, and so it's important to really go to these organizations that are or events that are maybe free events and looking there um, for your partners and for people that are going to help. Um, and um, that is just one way, but I know I already mentioned that. But yeah, it is difficult and it is, I, I can understand how, how discouraging that can be, for sure. Yeah, and to also just talk about, um, I like the idea of, of them taking turns because then it doesn't give one face to the library. It kind of, you know, you you think of the library as a staff, that's a team instead of just, you know, just the director, or just the children's librarian. Um, it just, it gets the community knowing everybody that they can go to everybody if they have something to talk about or that a need for that. And also um, just to go to is that make sure that what you, your partnerships that you create are adhering to your strategic plan and your goals for your library because being friends with everybody while it's awesome like does not benefit you in the long run because you're building up partnerships that are just time wasters you know what I mean like you know not time wasters but um the ones that don't necessarily they're just going to be a time suck basically because you're going to spend time cultivating this relationship that has nothing to do with something that you want to do at the library so just kind of picking your um your values for your library and for your programming that you want to do. I, I would add uh one other thing too like our library system like we have work groups or task force sometimes they come from the top and sometimes they they can come from person any person on staff that sees a community need or an interest and and they green light okay let's form a task force and then anyone else who's interested in that topic um you know can get together and look at it and and see what might come from it um so you know that might be a, a model for getting people um uh to come in uh, not i mean or be able to uh feel comfort uh, cultivating those relationships and such because you have a, a a team around you that's interested in the same um, subject. Um, I mean, some folks are go getters, but others are a little nervous, but they're still rich and deep in what they know and can offer. So, you know, there's different ways to draw that out of folks and, and back to Celeste's earlier point, just expressing appreciation and and making taking note when you see folks, you know, 
um, blossoming. You know, it, it, it does a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah, and this is great, and and I and I love uh, in particular, uh, Stacy, what you said about uh, yeah, like at the end of the day, this is part of your job, so <laughs> make sure that uh, benefits are coming back to the library. Um, and so um, I th I think that can be important to say, state out loud because I, I I know in some instances I hear librarians uh, will will tell me I feel like I'm giving and giving, but I'm not getting anything back. Um, and so, so making making sure that you are getting something back, and sometimes it's as simple as saying like, "Hey, I I need something," like <laughs> like, uh, and not being afraid to uh, communicate your needs and and what you need as an individual and what your library needs uh, in order for this to work. Um, and different people are going to have different needs, so so being kind of aware, uh, especially if you're in an administrative role, what um what different people may need uh, to feel comfortable and capable. Um. Kind of doing this work um so so great yeah and uh so keep keep putting thoughts uh in this jam board um just want to switch to our other jam board uh we asked people kind of uh based on on where where you're at now what are what are some of the new um relationships uh that that you all would like to start um um and so someone says they just met an aarp representative very eager to work with them um uh, lots of people putting a uh, lot of and uh, like to see more more seniors at sites. So kind of similar to that AARP, uh, we hear laundromats, barbershops, hair salons, apartment complexes, um, just a whole uh, wide variety. Um, and and one thing I'd love to ask uh, every everyone here, um, uh, uh, and and also I'll, I'll ask. Um, uh, uh, Celeste and Kelly and, and Stacy, but if anyone has thoughts uh, um, uh, who's also on the call, uh, definitely chime in uh, either in the chat or by unmuting. But um, uh, even even in small towns, uh, there's there's often a lot of potential. Uh, relationships, a lot of potential partnerships. Um, and so uh, and and that that uh, obviously is is much more true in in larger cities and urban environments. Um, and so given all the potential relationships that you could be out kind of building, um, how do you how do you decide kind of where where to invest your time and your library's time, given all the potential directions that you could go in in terms of relationship building? Um, uh, I'd love to hear um, any any thoughts from people on the call and and in particular our panelists if you have any thoughts on that question. Yeah, I think it is tricky to know like what is actually going to bring value to your community to your library. Um, I kind of give it the two or three email approach. <laughs> a lot of times whenever I'm messaging someone, if you know, whenever I get that response back, a lot of times it is positive and it is like, how can we make this work? And if we can make something work in like two or three emails and we can make a meetup work in, the, in that amount of time, I think um, it's someone that we're definitely willing to work with. Um, but then again, there are times when, you know, you're waiting like a week or two weeks and, um, or maybe, you know, they're like, you know, my schedule is really difficult, but it's, it might be someone you're really wanting to work with. Unfortunately, not everybody has the time at that moment. And as, as good as the opportunity may seem, it's kind of just one of those things you just have to learn to let go, put it on your calendar and reach out to them later. Um, be clear, be, hey, I know, you know, hey, I know I've, I've sent a lot of these emails. It was great. Um, I'm connecting with you. I'm going to table this for, you know, in four months, let's catch up again and see if, if a time works out for us. Um, but that's kind of where, what I do. I don't, I don't take a lot of time to go back and forth. I try to schedule something within that first, um, within that first email or within that first interaction. And it's, it behooves you to, to do that as well, to say, Hey, here's my schedule for this week. Can we meet up this week or next week and and just start off right away and, and also be clear about your budget that's another thing be clear about your budget within that first email hey if you can't pay them anything you need to let them know that <laughs> you know what i mean you can't you know expect them to be convinced to to get nothing if you can pay them 50 dollars, let them know that so, you know say our budget is this does this work for you if it doesn't 
let me know. You know, maybe we can do a little more, maybe we can't. Um, be clear about your budget, Be uh, give them some days to meet and um, create that interaction, that strong interaction first and foremost um, is my advice. Yeah, Celeste, uh, I love that. And I love that kind of uh, very, very clear. Uh, and, and like we've been discussing transparency, like, hey, here's here's kind of where I'm at. Uh, here's where I'm coming from. Um, here's what uh, we can offer. Um, and and I'd also love to hear, I, I see someone yeah, looking at this, uh, just met with an AARP rep, very eager to work with us. Um, one thing that we haven't talked too much about today, but uh, it would be uh, perhaps valuable to discuss. Um, one of the things that I've found um, in my research, and I'm sure you've probably found in your communities, um, is that often at a certain point, um, um, you 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 no longer necessarily have to be the one kind of always cold calling um and kind of trying to find new people to work with you at a certain point um you 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 become visible enough that people start coming to you and want to work with you um and so that's that's a different set of skills uh how how to kind of uh figure out who when people are coming to you um like celeste i think you said uh, and we found that the previous jam board sometimes people are just looking to sell their products um that process of okay now now we're having people coming to us and cold calling us um and how do we navigate that that side of the the process based on our experience kind of being the one doing all the cold calling um so i'd love to hear um any yeah if if any of you have had that experience and and any strategies that you've developed uh to kind of um uh work successfully when when people reach out to you um uh suggesting a, a partnership or a relationship um i've had a little bit of experience with this uh, i don't know if anybody's familiar with the brand fit matrix but um that is a really helpful resource. It basically breaks down the mission of your library and your potential partners, and you can see how your goals align. And then you can see if they will be willing, if they would be a good fit for your organization. Um, it's really helped me because uh, that's how I chose the Boys and Girls Club. Um, one of our other partnerships came out of that too. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but um, that does work really well, especially because I am a sucker for a toolkit or some sort of template that I can use that makes things easier. Who isn't? But yeah, if you haven't heard of it, um, it's the brand fit matrix. And um, it, 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 that's exactly what it does. Yeah, that's that's great, uh, uh, Stacy, and and that's actually a new one to me. So um, yeah, if you if you wouldn't mind kind of putting that in the chat, uh, that sounds like it could be a really really uh, valuable tool. Um, um, and and yeah, and anything else that uh, uh, and others uh, of you kind of online or yeah, of our panelists have found to kind of navigate that that process. I think it's just similar to what. Uh... Stacy said, I mean, there's that toolkit, but that's the first thing that came to my mind. Like if someone's approaching you like, hey, we want to grow our stream monitoring team and, you know, we don't have a, you know, space to gather folks, but, you know, um, the library has that space, but then too, like looking at it, you know, we, what does the library gain or how can we, you know, not only be supported, but it's like we can put on a great program because they're going to bring these cool creek critters that folks can look at under magnifying glasses and, and, and really bring that subject matter to life and talk about a local issue, clean water, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I think you're always kind of looking for how is it mutually beneficial? Is it, is it lopsided or is it kind of balanced? Like, you know, okay, well, we have this that we can offer and you have that and together, you know, we come up with a pretty swell something. So I, I think that's part of it um just looking for for that balance when it i mean it's not always equal but yeah yeah, absolutely. And I, I love what you said, Kelly, about um it, it's not always equal and, and being okay with that, being being okay with uh with sometimes uh relationships are strategically important for you or, or your library. Um and so it's okay if you feel like you're doing 70% of the work or even 80% of the work if it's a strategically important uh, relationship. Um but but having kind of the the kind of the the structure to kind of um uh yeah um uh, be be able to be upfront about kind of um about the about those matters um 
And yeah, and and th thanks to Last um, uh, for putting your email uh, and Instagram. Uh, really enjoyed having you on on the conversation. And, and Kelly and Stacy, definitely, uh, if you all need to get going, um, this is kind of our very uh, loosey goosey part of the the conversation. So um, floor is open to discuss any anything. And I see. Um, uh, I'll just uh, quick give a quick shout out to Beth uh, DeFarber, who's going to be uh, presenting. Um, at the final uh, part of this event uh, at three o'clock Eastern, um, 12 uh, Pacific for folks able to join us for our the final culminating part of the event, uh, which will also be recorded along with everything else and, and shared on our YouTube channel. Um, uh, but Beth uh, asks, um, uh, could we modify the project so that it also does this so libraries can include the needs benefits that can be met as well? Yeah, so I, I think, Beth, uh, what you're saying, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, being able to um, uh, have that that kind of negotiation skills, um, so it's not, so an idea is not necessarily just fixed in stone, um, we have to do this or that or the other, but being able to negotiate with, with partners um, and say, is there a way that maybe we could modify this idea in this way uh, so that it, it works for us uh, and, and works works for you? And negotiation is fine. I mean, I think negotiation sometimes uh, it seems like it's um, kind of a scary process, but negotiations are really, um, uh, we know this from, from psychology, um, uh, group psychology, uh, a pivotal part of kind of successful relationships. We know that relationships of all types that, that stand the test of time, whether it's um, uh, spouses, uh, best friends, um, Personal relationships, uh, they 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 all require negotiation at certain points. Um, um, uh, uh, a spouse uh, and their partner are going to have to negotiate at certain things during during the life of that relationship. And similarly, when you're working collaboratively with your community, uh, there there will be moments when you have to negotiate. Um, and being being aware of that, being being upfront about the importance of of negotiating skills, um, I think is a is a great a great point. Um, yeah, thanks, Stacy. Um, uh, thanks for your participation. Have a have a good rest of your day. Um, yeah, and, and I, I can I can sense that that conversation is starting to to wrap up. Um, so yeah, I would like to like to thank everyone again for your your participation. Um, uh, we'll we'll keep the Zoom open uh, just in case uh, people people want to want to participate. Uh, but we'll plan to kind of uh, reconvene um, in about forty five minutes. Um, for the last part of the event for anyone who would like to like to join us for that. Um, but uh, uh, if if you're not, that recording will be shared out with everyone um, uh, next next Monday. Um, but uh, but yeah, I wanna wanna thank everyone again for your time um, and participation. Um, and uh, yeah, have a have a good rest of your day and hope to see some of you again in about 40 minutes. Um, uh, but thanks everyone. Bye.